you ask a happily married couple, what advice do you have to give to young couples hoping to make their relationship last? A common response might be, don't let the sun go down on your anger. My husband Johnny and I were told that over and over again at the beginning of our marriage. It's good advice, right? It comes from scripture. Ephesians 4.26 says, be angry without sinning. Don't let the sun set on your anger. So Johnny and I took on our first year of wedded bliss with this wisdom on our minds. And so late into the night, we would argue because we couldn't let the sun set on our anger. Am I right? Until one day, a counselor said, go to bed. No rational discussion is going to happen late at night while you're exhausted. And so we did. And the next morning, we really weren't all that angry anymore. And the apologies and the grace flowed a whole lot easier on a good night's sleep. Maybe the concept of the sun setting on anger has been taken a little too literally. In scripture, references to the sun setting are sometimes about the end of a day, but they can also be about the end of a lifetime, not allowing your life to be lived in bitterness and to end in anger. You see, there's another passage that I personally think is much better advice for a new couple, or really anyone, wrapped up in a situation of struggle. As it says in Psalm 30, sing praises to the Lord, O you, his faithful ones. And give thanks to his holy name, for his anger is but for a moment, his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may linger for the night, but joy comes with the morning. Or in the CEB translation, you who are faithful to the Lord, sing praises to him. Give thanks to his holy name. His anger lasts only for a second, but his favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may stay all night, but by morning, joy. 2020 has felt for so many of us like one long night of weeping. We have been waiting for the morning light to break through. We have been waiting for a reminder of joy. Maybe that's why this Christmas season, live Christmas trees are selling out like never before. I hear the lot at Ted Drew's is completely sold out. More houses are covered in twinkling lights. More front yards are filled with larger than life giant inflatable Santa snowmen and elves as if out of a tacky scene from National Lampoons. And yet nobody seems to mind this year because everyone needs a reminder of joy. In the midst of suffering, joy still exists. How is that possible when the two seem to be such polar opposites? How can sadness, fear, worry, grief all coexist with joy? When Mary learns from the angel Gabriel that she is pregnant with the Son of God, her first go-to emotion is fear. We know this because of the words Gabriel uses to reassure her. Don't be afraid. Luke 1, 26 through 33 says, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a city in Galilee, to a virgin who is engaged to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David's house. The virgin's name was Mary. When the angel came to her, he said, Rejoice, favored one, the Lord is with you. She was confused by these words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. The angel said, Don't be afraid, Mary. God is honoring you. Look, you will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of David, his father, he will rule over Jacob's house forever, and there will be no end to his kingdom. The first words of the angel, rejoice, favored one. The first response of Mary, confusion and fear. You see, Mary is a young teenager, probably around 14 years old, a virgin, still a child living with her parents, promised to be married to Joseph, as was customary in those times. And she finds out she's pregnant. Even today, the thought of being pregnant as a 14-year-old is one that could ruin the reputation of a young teen. But in those days, it went far beyond rumors and side-eye glances and people feeling sorry for her. In Mary's day, becoming pregnant out of wedlock could be seen as dishonoring to her father, her fiancé, and could ultimately lead to her death by stoning. In verse 34, Mary goes on to say to the angel, how will this happen? 
since I haven't had sexual relations with a man. The angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come over you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the one who is to be born will be holy. He will be called God's son. And then he goes on to talk to her about her cousin Elizabeth. Look, even in her old age, your relative Elizabeth has conceived a son. This woman who was labeled unable to conceive is now six months pregnant. Nothing is impossible for God. So then Mary says, I'm the Lord's servant. Let it be with me just as you have said. And the angel leaves her. In that moment, Mary commits herself to the will of God. Do you think she was happy? Think about it. Her life in a matter of seconds has completely changed. She's gone from being a virgin who has the promise of a marriage to a good man. Her future is pretty set. And now she has to wonder, will anyone believe me? Will Joseph believe me? Or will he think I was unfaithful? Will he still marry me? God will take care of me, surely, but will I be physically alone to care for this baby? So she goes to her cousin, the same one the angel has told her about. She enters the home of her cousin Elizabeth and her husband Zachariah, and this is my favorite part. In verse 41, it says, When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. With a loud voice, she blurted out, God has blessed you above all women, and he has blessed the child you carry. Why do I have this honor that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as I heard your greeting, the baby in my womb jumped for joy. So we don't know why Mary made the long journey to visit her cousin. I have to wonder if it's because she just needed to be with someone who could understand the insane and supernatural things happening to her. And in that moment, despite all the swirling emotions and fears that likely still lingered, she was met with joy. The joy she experiences is not removed and separate from everything else she is going through. The joy comes in spite of her difficult circumstances. And Mary begins to praise God in what is often called the Song of Mary or the Magnificat, which in Latin means, my soul magnifies the Lord. Listen to the words of Mary, starting in verse 46. Mary said, with all my heart, I glorify the Lord. In the depths of who I am, I rejoice in God, my Savior. He has looked with favor on the low status of his servants. Look, from now on, everyone will consider me highly favored because the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. He shows mercy to everyone from one generation to the next who honors him as God. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered those with arrogant thoughts and proud inclinations. He has pulled the powerful down from their thrones and lifted up the lowly, filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty handed, has come to the aid of his servant Israel, remembering his mercy just as he promised to our ancestors, to Abraham and to Abraham's descendants forever. Notice that in her praise, she begins to call out how God is merciful and just. She names that she is just another low status servant, a poor young woman with no wealth, no power, no importance in society, yet God is calling her out and lifting her up. She names that God uplifts the lowly and feeds the hungry. It is a song of resistance. It is a song that declares joy even in the midst of struggle and oppression. Or as the poet Toy Derricotte refers to it, joy is an act of resistance. For hundreds of years, People have sung the words of African-American spiritual songs first sung by slaves, rejoicing in the Lord and declaring God's promises of true and everlasting freedom that no matter what could not be taken from them. We've been studying these songs in our Monday night Advent study, and we've learned that slaves use these spirituals not only to encourage one another and to draw closer to the Lord, but as coded messages that would help lead to their escape. 
Songs sung in the fields proved that these were not merely just happy-go-lucky, naive people, but strategic planners who worked not only to stay alive in their spirit, but also to escape to their physical freedom. Often at Christmas time, they were given a little bit more time off from their slave labor by their owners, and so it became a time to execute escape plans. Songs like Mary Had a Baby and the Train Done Gone seem at surface level to be telling the scriptural story of the birth of Jesus and promised eternal life that shouldn't be missed out on like a train leaving, but may have also helped send word about not missing out on the plan for escape on the Underground Railroad. Joy is an act of resistance. Joy and happiness are often words that are used interchangeably, and yet they're very different. Scripture tells us that joy is a fruit of the Spirit, a gift, a deep abiding sense of God's faithfulness which sustains us, while well, happiness is a fleeting and temporal emotion. Mary may not have been happy to have all her plans uprooted and her life turned upside down, but she found joy in the Lord. She clung to God's promises and she rejoiced. I asked my friends on Facebook to tell me the difference between happiness and joy. Many of you responded. One of my favorite responses came from one of our own congregants who said, happiness comes from what you have and where you are. Joy comes from who you are and where you belong. Mary knew in that moment who she was. She was highly favored and chosen by God. She knew where she belonged on the path God had set before her of birthing the Messiah. It's easy to get bogged down by what we have or don't have and the circumstances which surround us. Last night while I was finishing writing the sermon about joy, I found out about a teacher nearby who died of COVID and another teacher, just 25 years old, who was put on a ventilator due to COVID yesterday. Then I got a message from a friend whose marriage was ending due in part to the stress of job loss and financial strain brought on by the pandemic. And then I heard about another friend who was given an emergency medical diagnosis, totally unrelated to COVID, told she needed to be in a hospital immediate attention, but was turned away from every hospital in our region due to a lack of space because of COVID. All of this happened yesterday, last night, in the midst of trying to pull together a message for you about joy. I'll be honest, I struggled to lean into joy when it felt like I was drowning in the suffering of those around me. But ultimately, I keep going back to the gospel message, which says that even in the midst of our grief, our pain, our struggle, as believers in Jesus Christ, we have a promise of a God who is present with us, Emmanuel. We have a joy that coexists with suffering, just as Jesus suffered in love for each and every one of us and conquered death. I believe even when things are at their worst, joy is an act of resistance. Joy points us back to our Lord and Savior, born to a poor refugee teenage girl with no power, no privilege, and no status. Born to set the prisoner free, to liberate us from the chains which bind us. As I close today, I want to leave you with the words of Reverend Anna Bladell, written for the website and fleshed. The joy of God does not come as naive optimism or surface level feel goodness. Joy cannot be imposed from on high. Joy cannot be commanded. The joy of God with us is mingled with grief, exists side by side with mourning, knows that pain and death are all too real, but do not have the final word. This joy tends tenderly to beauty and softness and the gladness that comes from paying attention to what matters. The joy of God with us is collective, liberating us from deadly despair. Joy is gestating in darkness. It comes unexpectedly. Joy invites our expectation and demands our participation. So prepare the way for joy with sorrow. May joy be birthed among, within, and through us this Advent. Friends, weeping may last for the night, for a season, but joy comes in the morning. Or as a friend of mine says, we just need the sun to come up.
Friends, the Son of God is coming. O come, O come, Emmanuel. Amen.